really using that as our research facility to understand how um, these, uh, these products, the current products work and what the future products could look like and how could they, uh, how could they be very, very different and reinvented like you saw here with the Nest Protect. So we have two products now. Um, Nest Protect and the Nest Learning Thermostat. We've been on the market in the U.S. just over two years, and we have just now sold the uh, Nest Protect into the U.K. and then from there into other countries in Europe. So uh, a quick, quick, quick job to just two years. So it's been great. And you know, so it's been great, right? You guys have the funding. You're doing well. You've got traction. Uh, and then you sell to Google for $3.2 billion. <laughs> you didn't have to do it. I, I mean, obviously that's a lot of money, right? Yeah. Um, but you didn't, you didn't necessarily have to do it yet, right? What, take me behind the scenes, maybe those conversations with Larry Page, specifically, whoever, why, why decide, I mean, this, this company, people were saying you guys could go public, you guys could be, as we right. talk about the internet of things and, and these smart devices, you guys could be it. So why go to Google? So, first and foremost, you have to re realize that, you know, we are, you are correct, we are doing really well, but our vision is much bigger than just being a smoke alarm and a, and a uh, smart thermostat company. Our vision is to really change the world. You know, we were able to uh, dramatically over a period of 10 years back in Cupertino take the same team that was built basically in Esprotect and the learning thermostat and change the entire world. But we were only able to do that when we had scale. We had a small team, you know, it started as 20 people and then it grew to about 400 and then 1,000. But we had teams of thousands and thousands behind us being able to take what we did and spread it all across the globe and to really, really add impact people. Our team always set out with a vision to change the home and change the homes around the world. And the only way to do that was with tremendous scale and tremendous resources. Being a small company, we can do a lot. But when you look at our products, we're not just a, a, an electrons company. We just can't just download software in, in different languages around the world and all of a sudden it works. We are a hardware, software, and services company that has to tailor our products to homes all around the world. That means we have to change the products. We have to get them registered and certified. There's so many things that go into these kinds of products and to make sure that they are a true experience. You know, how heating and cooling is done in the US is very different than how it's done in Germany, how it's different done in, in the Nordics or in, in the UK, and it requires product changes. That requires time, it requires capital. It requires a lot of mental, uh, uh, you know, uh, mental, uh, cycles to be able to do those things. So when I when when we first started, I was probably spending 50% of my time building the company and 50% of my time building products. If I just go back to just about, you know, five weeks ago, ten weeks ago, I was spending 95% of my time worrying about infrastructure. Where was I going to get service and where was I going to get, you know, the right uh, customer service and installation networks in each country. And I was spending 5% of my time building the products that our team really wants to build. That isn't a great use of my time. I want to build differentiated products. I don't want to spend, build time, spend time building undifferentiated infrastructure. It was just driving me nuts. So what does Nest, now that it's a part of Google, what does that look, look like? I, I know we were talking backstage about, there are all the buzzwords about the internet of things and connected devices, yet it still hasn't 100% gone mainstream. Is this what you, you're thinking will be the game changer? Well, well for us, as part of, uh, of Google, we're going to be able to get the access to all of that infrastructure I just talked about that we need. But the, at the end of the day, Nest will remain Nest. We will have the Nest brand. We will have our sales, we will have our marketing forces, we will have our product teams. We're talking about all the other stuff un underneath the covers that needs to get, uh, you know, needs to, that we need to tap into to bring our products out. So, a $3.2 billion acquisition, they, they didn't just get a smart thermostat or a smart smoke detector, they also got design talent, right? When, when you look at uh, your reputation in, in the Valley, it's very much about design, and design we're hearing more and more about. Right. Could this acquisition mean you're potentially helping design different hardware products for Google? Well, you know, right now, our 
vision is to build out the Nest vision, and that was what we clearly communicated to Larry and the team, and that's what they communicated back. Build the thing that you guys really want to build. And if you have some spare cycles sometime in the future, maybe you might want to look at other things. But right now, we are staying as Nest, and we're building the thing that we already have, and building it for the world. That's what we're here to do. That's what we're really set, uh, setting our minds to. And you know, talk to us in four or five years. Maybe that'll have changed. But we have a big, we have a lot of work to do before uh, before we can just say we're going to move on to something else. What does the connected home? Right. Everyone's talking about the connected home, where you know you can walk in and people, your home knows you as as much as maybe your spouse knows you. Right. I mean, what what does this look like in the future? I mean, how, what stage are we at, and, and where are we going here? Well, how many people in here have somewhat, they think they have some kind of uh, form of a connected home? Does anyone in here think they have, have some? Okay, a few people here. How many of it doesn't actually work and it doesn't drive you absolutely bonkers? Can somebody raise their hand for that? Uh, a lot less people. So there's been a dream of the connected home since the 80s, you know, and maybe even since the 50s. We heard about the smart home, press one button, the food happens, the, 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 the home's clean, you know, what have you. It's been told to us since we were kids over and over and over. But if we look at the home today, why are the smoke detectors the same smoke detectors we grew up with, or the thermostats, or the light switches? Everything is basically the same since we were pitched this vision in the 70s or the 80s or what have you. Things have, uh, have not changed. Even though we believe in a connected home, we all want that. There's so many things that have to change before it's actually gonna realize this vision that we've been pitched for multiple decades. So what, when you hear connected home, I hear, oh, I press one button and the shades go down and the lights go down, the TV comes on and the popcorn starts popping and <laughs> that's BS. It's total BS. What we need to do is take product by product and innovate that. Remove the difficulties, remove the inconveniences, and make each product work well. That's the way consumers will purchase things, is by a point product, by a point product, by a point product. They're not gonna go and re remove everything in their homes for some vision of the future, spend thousands and thousands of dollars to put in new infrastructure to get one thing to work. It's not gonna work, we're gonna do it point by point by point. Why is Google the right match for you guys? Besides the fact that you know they're the ones offering up, I mean, Google, we're seeing Google more and more invest in hardware, and they're, they're buying robotics companies, you know, they're building out Google Glass. I mean, why is Google the best fit, as opposed to, you know, you've got the background from Apple. I mean, why Google, and why are you excited specifically to go to this company? Well, to, well there's a personal reason, and there's also a, um, uh, there's also just a, a, a larger corporate reason. So the personal reason, you know, I've, I've met with many companies and I've met with individuals from all over the world about not just NAS but at Apple. And when I met with Larry and the management team there, when my brain started, typically you go in the meeting and you go, okay, I'm gonna tell everybody about what we do and I'm gonna, te I'm gonna teach a lot of people about what we do. When I was with them, the amount, and I've been in the Silicon Valley 25 years now, the amount of things I learned from them personally in the same meetings that they learned from me personally. The two-way inter interchange of the, for me, intellectual happiness and stimulation of being able to go back and forth and really create a new world together in a different way than either of us imagined, that was personally exciting. What'd you learn from them? What'd Larry say? I can't tell you. All I can say is we were, we were finishing each other's sentences um, and the visions that we had were just so large and so great and they weren't scared by them. We were both getting exhilarated by what could change and how things could change and that we could have the ability together to change those things. So to me, personally, the intellectual happiness and the bold vision of what, what the corporation does and what they do every day and where they want to go was like, this is a hand in glove fit, right? Because mostly when you think about companies and when they merge, they're usually somewhat competitors. And there's a lot of overlap between them. They're like, okay, we're gonna overlap and we're gonna get rid of the, um, the redundancy. We're gonna get remove the redundancy. What we needed was the redundancy 
And we're going to be able to be complementary to everything that they do. So very, very different way of thinking. And that's why I was just so jazzed by uh, the meetings that we had. This was a long process. This was not a short 15-minute conversation. Here's a number and, and, and give away the keys to the car. How long was the process? It took months. It actually took years in some cases. Um, and I gotta ask you the privacy question, right? Because, sure. you know, we all have these connected devices increasingly. And I started covering connected devices a year ago. And now my new story is so-and-so hacks into this connected device or data collection and all these things that come along with new territory. Sure. You know, now that you guys are backed by Google, Google's a data-driven company. You guys are going to have these devices in people's homes more and more. That's the goal. Sure. Right now, your privacy policy states that essentially you can collect data to make the product better. Is that going to change? No. At this point, there are no changes. We are absolutely um, uh, about the data that we collect is all about our products. We are going to be totally and, and improving them. If there were ever any changes whatsoever, we will be sure to be transparent about it, number one, and number two, to, for you to opt into it. So we have no changes planned, and the data is to stay within Nest's world of uh, improving its products. So my smart thermostat's not going to start like giving me sweater ads or something if it knows I get cold easily. Like, <laughs> Not that I know. Of, yeah, can we, we promise? <laughs> if we ever change it, I'll let you know. Cool. Well, I, I also I want to talk, because I know your, your background is from Apple. I mean, and you work closely with Steve Jobs. And a lot of us are fascinated you know, by Steve Jobs and what they kind of created. Um, and you were also at Apple during a time when Apple wasn't, quote, unquote, winning, right? I, I mean, where they were kind of struggling a little bit. What was it like uh, working with Steve Jobs? I mean, what did he contribute to your vision today? Well, Steve, Steve really um, showed me what it means to make a product experience. And an experience is not just using the product and making sure it's beautiful. Um, you know, I kind of learned that before because I worked with the Mac team pre, pre Apple, and they, they taught me how to make great products. But what, about making great experiences, experiences are all about the very first time you ever learn about the company. Whether it was a video you just saw, or the first time you saw it maybe in a retail shop, or when the first time you heard it from a friend, you said, this is something you should really take a, uh, take a look at. It's starting from that very first customer touch point and looking at every single touch point and making sure there's emotional, positive momentum all the way through that experience. So, their first contact with it, your second contact with it, when you take it out of the box, how you might configure or install it, how it's used, how it's serviced, all of those things need to be uh, taken into account to create an amazing experience. And so if you look at something like what they're doing with the retail and all of those other things, you'll see that customer touch points throughout every single um, single area um, and, and, and making sure the brand comes to life and the product comes to life through that. When it comes to branding and product and the stuff that kind of this is in your DNA, I mean, is that something you'll take to Google? Or are you going to be the, the design guy at Google? You know, the guy behind? I, 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 am, I and my team are the design people to create Nest at Google. I think if you look at other parts of Google, there's a lot of great stuff going on. There's a lot of great design on it. So at any company, we're not the only thing. I think there's lots of things that we can learn from them and they can learn from us. Um, and let's talk about failure because, and you know, I think entrepreneurs and so many times, especially in the media, we tell these big stories and we put out the fact that you can acquire for billions of dollars and that kind of stuff, but not as many folks talk about how difficult right. specific times it, it, it can be to be an entrepreneur. Can you just, not all of us are winning as much right now, so just give us you know, a war story or give us a well, time where you just you really failed. I've been, I've been starting companies since I was in, in high school. So this is not my first rodeo. I, I've been, I've made startups inside of large companies, and they've been failed. I used to work at Philips, and we did the first Philips Velo and Nino, which were CE Windows CE products. Those are critical successes, market failures, general magic. The, the, the creators of the Macintosh basically made the iPhone 20 years too early. It was a tremendous failure. Three quarters of a billion dollars were invested in that company, and we sold maybe 5,000 devices. So we've had, I have had tons of failure. I had tons of failure in our, in, our, in, our, in our small startups as well as our big ones. So it's called perseverance. You know, I don't have hair because I've you know, been in the valley for 25 years. This is not just lightning strikes and a 23-year-old gets to be a billionaire. Look, 25 years, I think I kind of deserve it by now. So, so, look. <laughs> But, but I, I, 
want to be that smug, but literally it does take a lot of effort, it does take a lot of learning, and learning comes through failure, and learning comes by doing. And so hopefully each of you can all have your successes, but they do come in time. They don't come the first time out. You know, lightning does strike and you do get lucky, but it's very, very rare. But stay in the game, hang in the game, because at the end of the day, whoever was the king, the king goes on, he, he, he leaves his post, and there, the kings are in this room next, the next day, and the next day, and the next generation. Just hang in there. Sooner or later, if you do a good job, the world will recognize it. And I, I know we've got to wrap up soon, um, but you're an inventor, right? Not many people can say they're inventors. You see, you try to look in the future and see what's next. Um, so the iPod, you saw you know, the connected home trend. What's next? What's next? What should all these investors be investing? Well, I, you know, I think I, we're, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing everything about the car. I think the car takes longer because of all the regulations and, and just the. Uh, but here in Germany, you know, I see so much going on with the connected car. We don't see a lot of it yet that's touching consumers because of all the processes it takes to make a really safe automobile. But I, I absolutely believe there's a lot of space. It's not just big companies that are innovating in the connected car space, lots of small companies. And I think you're going to see some tremendous things over the next three years coming out of that, that space. And you're an angel investor too, you also invest. I mean, what types of companies are the companies you're investing in right now? I, I, for me, the, my most favorite companies are the ones that have deep technology. Not execution-based plays, but deep technology where most people don't understand what it is and how it can affect the world. And it might take four or five years to get out to really change things. Most people look at something with, oh, I have this many eyeballs, I'm going to invest in it because there's momentum. I invest in the things that most investors don't understand. They don't understand how the technology can dramatically change that product or that service. Those are the companies that I really love to, love to invest in because then I can help them with my knowledge and my network to bring those things to light and make changes where other people fear to tread. Great. And last question, because I ask every entrepreneur this. I mean, you just sold your company for billions of dollars, um, long term in the making. What, what keeps you up at night? What is the one thing that, that you're really, really jazzed about, worried about, anything? To me, what's all, it's, what, what I'm always concerned about is my team and their motivations and what we do and how we do it. So I'm always worried about making sure we get the best of our, out of our people. So the very first thing I said to the company when we talked about the acquisition and the number, the, the thing that I said to them is, don't change. You may have money, you may have resources now, but the reason we got here is because of the people you are and the people. Uh, the, about your energy and effort to get here. It's not, it, just because you have money doesn't mean that you're all, all of a sudden more special or you should change the way you do things. Make sure you stay yourself, make sure you stay uh, true to our mission and let's move on. It's just a number, push it aside. Yes, your might, life might be more comfortable, but let's get back to the job. Let's make sure we stay on this mission and to change the world. I think later. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Ich krank bin Kimmer ins Spital. Der Herr Professor, der hat gesagt, das ist ein ernster Fall. Der muss genau behandelt werden, ein richtiges Phänomen. Doch alles war gleich um ein Sonst, mir hilft keine Medizin. Bringt's mir ein Stein an den Maßbrück her, die Krankheit finden ist nicht schwer. Erst kürzlich hat's mir dran, da wohl, dass sie im Himmel war. 
Vorm her, wo bin ich gestanden und um mich die Engelschar. Mit Milch und Honig haben sie mich im Himmel regaliert. Auch Nektar und Ambrosia am Engel mir serviert. Zum Herrgott hab ich gesagt, ich dank, ob's den Herrn und Korn Bier aus Schank. Denn nur ein Bier, nur ein Bier, nur ein Bier will ich auch. Sonst hau ich alles dank, sonst hau ich alles dank. Nur ein Bier, nur ein Bier, nur ein Bier. Thank you.